because the working classes are always ready to bring about social change because they're the ones that have been downtrodden for much longer. But it's when the middle classes realise that they are getting screwed in one way, shape or form, that's when things start to happen. The working classes are already there going, my oh God, about time, let's go. But it needs the middle classes to drive it. I mean, that's what happened in, in uh, 1916, basically. I mean, it was because of the British government's decision at the time to conscript the young men of the middle classes in Ireland that the middle classes reacted and led to uh, independence uh, a few years later. You know, what he was talking about, the banksters need to be in jail, that's exactly what's going on in Iceland. You know, just a month ago, they arrested their bankers, and like I said, you know, the former Prime Minister is uh, under arrest for, for malfeasance. Here's an article from uh, today, which I think absolutely spells it out. He says, you know, this is Konstantin Gurdjieff, they must act quickly. The hardest part of the general election 2011 for Finnegan and Labour is yet to come. After yesterday's celebrations this week will start for both parties with a political wrangle over positions of power, this too will be the easy part. However, come next week, the entire weight of the ongoing crisis will fall on the shoulders of Mr. Kenyon's colleagues. There is no rule book to consult here. There isn't. There isn't a rule book. They're being told what to do by the banksters. One of the reasons that the banksters like it when there's a whole new bunch of members of parliament, TDs, is because they don't know the ropes. And they can be pretty easily manipulated. There is old policies having comprehensively failed to stabilise our banking system will be of no use. Now, either this guy's writing from the heart, or it's a naive observation. It's going to take Ender Kenny to grow some balls. And I'm afraid to say that is pretty much this nation's only hope in the short term. Because if in a hundred days he has not made any fundamental change in direction to the direction already laid down by Carol and Lenihan, well, what can we say? What can we say? You know, 100,000 young people will leave the country this year, probably next year, and within probably four or five generations, you know, this beautiful island will effectively be uh, an economic wasteland. Andy Kelly, people tell me you don't have experience in government. I say, does anyone ask a woman about to have a child if she has had any training? Okay. Well, you know, the, this is a flippant observation. Over here he says, I realise I don't take myself seriously. He better start down while taking himself seriously, because if he doesn't take himself seriously, then the banksters, the EU Commission, Shell, Exxon, and all the other companies won't take him seriously either. And what you'll end up with is a situation like uh, we saw <coughs> in Iraq. You know, this is the mandate he's been given. I mean, I don't think I've ever spoken in a country before that is at such a point in its history. We've had an election. Had an election. Oli Wren tried to get every party in the doll to sign in to the bailout package. He didn't succeed. These guys have no reason to buy in to the cowan Lenihan package. They have an opportunity to say, sorry, that was then, this is now, blank sheet of paper. The same with Shell, the same with Exxon, the same with Marathon. And, you know, Theresa referenced Statoil. Norway is not in the EU. Norway is a sovereign nation. It is part of Europe. It <coughs> trades with the EU. But it has retained control of its national natural resources. It's fishing. And Norway's attitude with its fishing is far more sustainable than what's going on in the EU. Just a quick 
a quick illustration of how outrageous and absurd the EU fishing policy is. Fishermen are restricted from what they can land, right? Both in terms of species of fish and in terms of volume. So what they have to do is they actually have to sort the catch on board the ship and anything that is additional to their permitted catch has to be thrown over the side, by which time, of course, it's dead. So in the EU, we have no way of recording what has been caught. We only know that a fisherman is going to bring in their quota, because the quota has been set. We have no idea what was caught. The Norwegians, the Norwegians require all of the fish caught to be landed so that they can track exactly what has been caught. And then they will simply tell the fishermen that you know, they can only work for you know, 10 days in the next 30 or whatever because they're, they're at their quota. But the Norwegians absolutely keep track of fishing stocks because they know that you know, what's been caught, what's alive, not how much has uh, been thrown over the side because our fishermen aren't even required to record the total catch. It's completely and utterly outrageous. So Norway, I mean, it's a small country. Well, it's a big country, but it's, uh, in, in terms of population, it's not that much bigger than Ireland. I think it has a population of about 6 million. But it has taken care of its resources. And a lot of, uh, <coughs> a lot of um, Norwegians stay in Norway because they have an extremely good lifestyle. It's very expensive for anybody visiting Norway. But it's, a, it's ostensibly a socialist country in terms of the way in which it provides support for its citizens. They don't have any problems with hospitals closing, with care being provided for elderly or the sick. I mean, when I was in the oil industry, um, you know, I purchased a company that was uh, uh, based in, in Oslo, and um, this guy had a <coughs> child. And the state support for this guy was absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, it was, it was exactly what you know, I would dream of in terms of what state support should be. <coughs> Consequently, of course, he would never leave uh, Norway. He had no reason to. So the Irish people are absolutely in a tremendous place. And the eyes of the world are on Ireland. Because many people from Spain... Portugal, Italy, and the UK know that whatever happens in Ireland now is effectively going to establish the template for what's going to happen in these other countries. And let me tell you, the IMF and the, and the uh, World Bank are already acknowledging that they will not get away in Spain, Portugal, Italy, or the UK with what they've got away with in Ireland. In Ireland, they simply took everything. There was no allowances, no acknowledgement of bankers' liability whatsoever. The whole of the debt was passed on to the taxpayer. They know they're not going to get away with it again, so now they're already saying, well, you know, when we, when we um, have this problem in Portugal, we probably need to look at the bondholders accepting an element of responsibility. And they're talking about 20-30%. And so what they're doing is they're giving the bondholders the heads up to actually start making their preparation for when the negotiations kick in, and they're going to have to swallow 30% under the new guidelines that are being prepared right now. I mean, once again, do you get the idea of how Ireland has been subjected to literally the pillage, the pillage of its resources? You know, now, we were speaking to um, audiences all over Ireland in, over the last uh, three months. And I know, you know that there are many people who, of course, are seriously concerned about what's going on here. And to be frank, to be frank I mean, whilst I admire all the people that provide direct challenge, um, you know, in and around uh, Corrib and um, you know, down in Cork and elsewhere, right now, Right now, the focus needs to be on Ender Kenny. He needs to understand that the Irish people are aware that alternatives can be brought to bear. 
And those alternatives need to be bought or introduced sooner rather than later. Otherwise, you know, the election was a complete waste of time. What it needs to, is what it needs is Ender Kenny to say, you know what, you can offer me as much as you like. Our template is going to be that of Iceland. And by the way, we're on the phone and John Birkins is on his way over here right now. <laughs> now the, Iceland know that they are going to have to accept some responsibility. They know that because already the, uh, they're feeling the effects of um, you know, their decision on, on pension funds. So they know they've got to make some movement. They're not saying, well, they did initially, they're not saying right now that that is it, you know, there's no movement. They're prepared to negotiate, but they've established their benchmark. You know, in Ireland, the benchmark, you know, what have we got? What have we got here? So Ollie Wren, you know, offering a biscuit, I mean, yeah, it's uh, no, you know, diplomacy. It's the policy they're playing. Yeah, exactly. But it needs, it, of course, and the negotiations will drag through, but what it really needs is Andy Kenny to say, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. I've been given a mandate. The Irish people have spoken. And my mandate is completely the opposite of uh, my predecessors. So, I don't know how this is going to play out. I've got a nasty feeling, but, <coughs> you know, and it, of course it's not the end of the game, by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't know what it's going to take. But, let me tell you that uh, a little over 15 months ago, I gave a presentation in, it would be uh, November of 2009. And in that presentation, I said, we are literally a few days away from the first vestiges of global governance being implemented. It's in a DVD that I recorded, it's called The Green Agenda and Population Reduction. And I said, unless something really incredible happens in the next few days, come the first week of December, in Copenhagen, we will see the carbon trading implemented, and we will see the first vestiges of global governance. Two days after I recorded that presentation, the Climate Gate email was released, which completely derailed that whole process. That's why you haven't heard very much about carbon trading for 15 months. And it's why Al Gore, who was totally convinced that the sea levels were going to rise by 25 feet in the next 30 years, has bought some beachfront property in California. <laughs> if it hadn't been for the release of those climate gate emails, which nobody could have predicted, we would right now be looking at even less autonomy in, in Europe than, uh, than we have at present, because we would be absolutely part of global governance. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going to come out of left field, but I'm always looking. I'm always hoping that somebody will release something or some information will come to, into uh, the public arena that completely undermines this agenda and gives the Irish people the opportunity to regain their national sovereignty. Where does Ireland need to go in the medium term? It absolutely needs to come out of the EU. Ireland is potentially the wealthiest nation in terms of natural resources in Western Europe, which is exactly the reason it's been targeted. It needs to be a Norway. It needs to recognise that it's part of Europe, that it will trade with Europe, but it will not <coughs> cede any, any aspect of its self-determination. It needs to come out of the Euro. It needs to re-establish its own <coughs> currency. It needs to shut down the central bank and establish a Bank of Ireland where it is the people who are printing the money, putting the money into circulation, and the people that are benefiting from the interest, not the private bankers. I think at that point I'm going to hand the floor over to the questions. Thank you.